Let me begin uh, by thanking the organizer for the opportunity to advocate synchrotron radiation. This is my field. All right, so let me just get started. <clears throat> So this is what I'm going to do. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with synchrotron radiation, I'll give you a brief introduction. And then I would, uh, I would comment on high energy resolution spectroscopy in X-ray absorption, X-ray emission, uh, and I use a bimetallic system as an example. At the end, um, I'll, I'll provide some of my perspective uh, on the prospects of where the synchrotron technology is going. All right, so what is synchrotron radiation? Uh, when electrons uh, are circulating in an orbit at high speed, it emits light in the forward direction in a very, very low cone. So it's a very highly collimated uh, light emission uh, in, in the direction tangent to the orbit, right? So, and, and this collimation is defined by what is known as a, an opening angle, which is determined by the energy of the electron. Just give you an example. Uh, at the Canadian light source, which is a 2.9 GeV uh, uh, synchrotron, the opening angle is only on, of the order of 0.1 degree, right? Uh, 0.01 degree. So it's a very, very small. All the light are coming out in a very narrow cone. So let's say if we uh, turn on the synchrotron as a light bulb, uh, and then what we see is we have in this light bulb, we have infrared, we have UV visible, we have X-rays, right? And, and the, the higher the energy of the electron, the more X-ray you get. So this is what it's looked like inside a synchrotron. Here's the electron accelerator where the electrons are circulating and tangent to the orbit, light is coming out and you can use this light for experiment. Okay, so uh, how do we, uh, I try to understand the structure and electronic behavior of materials with synchrotron light. Uh, and, and of course, uh, and uh, X-ray interacts with matter either by scattering or absorption, right? So today I'm, I'm gonna place the emphasis on X-ray absorption spectroscopy. All right, so let's start with an atom, okay? So we, we shine X-ray on an atom, it absorbs X-ray and it goes into excited state, right? Now the absorption process is a, is a quantum transition and excite the core electron into previously unoccupied electronic states. And if you increase the energy X-ray and then eventually you can excite the electron into the continuum, all right? So the electron can propagate uh, in the continuum and disappears. So if you track the absorption coefficient of an atom, uh, then what we are seeing is, is that below the threshold, uh, you have some uh, very low transitions, uh, which are called the ribbon transitions. And as you're approaching the threshold, you see a, a, a rough rise in the absorption coefficient, which is long as the absorption edge, right? Absorption edge is specific to elements. And then if above the absorption threshold, above the edge, you'll see a monotonic absorption coefficient, right? Okay, so that's in the free atom. Now, but if you place a, this atom in a chemical environment, such as in a diatomic molecule, then, then what you are seeing is that uh, the electron now propagating away from the atom, right? The photoelectronic side of X-rays and can can interfere, it sees the labeling atom, right? And then you can prop the property of the, le the, le the nearest label, for example, by best scattering interference, okay? So the result of that is a modulation in the absorption coefficient compared to the free atom, okay? So uh, in the absorption coefficient, then you can see the rebirth stays are quenched. All right, and you can see the lumo begin to show up as a pit at the edge, and you see oscillations above the threshold. Okay, all right. So if you subtract the atomic contribution, so the modulation on top of the monotonic atomic contribution is known as the X-ray absorption fine structure. And this fine structure in principle contains everything about the neighborhood of the absorbing atom. So this is where why X-ray absorption spectroscopy is so powerful. 
Okay, so to summarize, X-ray absorption spectroscopy is basically the spectroscopy of absorption edges of elements, right? Because each element has its characteristic specific absorption edge. So this tells you this element and size specific. Okay, so let's just give you an example and how X-ray absorption spectroscopy can, PY, can provide us information. Uh, let's look at the case of 4D transition metals, right? Okay, so uh, here is the density of states of silver and palladium, right? Near the Fermi level. In the case of silver, the 4D is full. Uh, in the case of palladium, uh, the 4D uh, stay unoccupied. So there's some unoccupied states above the Fermi level. And in fact, it's these unoccupied states that play a very important role in catalysis. Okay. All right. So let's look at what the absorption spam looks like if we're exciting a 2p electron, say 2p3 half from the palladium uh, to the unoccupied electronic states. Okay. All right. So let's look at the the L3 edge of palladium and silver, in the case of palladium, all right, you can see they're very sharp spike, right? So this spike is often known as the white light when there's an intense transition, okay? And this transition actually arrived from dipole transition from the, from the core level to P3 half to the unoccupied for these days. Okay, so therefore the area under the curve can be used to prop the unoccupied density of states above the Fermi level. In the case of silver, there's no unoccupied D bands above the Fermi level. So you don't see any spike, you don't see any white light. Okay, all right. So this can apply to alloys, for example. Okay, now we start from palladium. We are diluting palladium in silver, right? And see what happened to the white light. And clearly we go from palladium uh, to palladium three silver, and then uh, further dilute, right? And we can see there's a change, a system, systematic change in the area under the curve, right? And in this way, right? In this way, so going from pure premium to more dilute alloy and so on. And by analyzing this data, it's very clear that it's silver to palladium for charge transfer. Okay, so uh, by X-ray absorption spectroscopy, the edge can tell us something about the density of states at the Fermi level of D character, and which is very important to, ca to catharsis. All right, so there are relating techniques, right? There are relating techniques, uh, uh, and that is important, and that's the, that is what I'm going to talk about today, right? It's about the excitation spectroscopy. So once the coho is created in an atom, the outer electron is going to fill it, and the energy difference is emitted as a photon called fluorescence X-rays, right? So fluorescence X-ray is something that can be used to identify the atom. Right, and the fluorescence X-ray can also be used to be called X-ray absorption because uh, the X-ray absorption, uh, the 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 intensity of the, the fluorescence X-ray or X-ray emitted uh, because of the presence of the coho is directly proportional to the absorption coefficient. Okay. So in, in this common practice, X-ray absorption spectroscopy is measured uh, with uh, with the X-ray fluorescent yield uh, using a solid state detector, which often have a modest resolution. So what I'm going to emphasize today is to tell you what happens if you use very high energy resolution fluorescence detection of the X-ray absorption uh, spectrum. All right, so let me just give you an example uh, to illustrate what X-ray emission really is. So let's pick a intermediate atomic number element like a phosphorus, right? So on the right hand side, here's the energy diagram of a phosphorus. Now, if we excite uh, the one S electron by exciting say a KH absorption, right? So we create a queer hole, core hole, then the electron from the valence band can drop down here to fill the core hole and the energy is emitted as a fluorescence X-ray. So if we track the fluorescence X-ray, we are backing out the valence band. So this is what is known as the valence band to core transition. So in the case of phosphorus, right? So this is essentially K beta, 
right? And from the waistband region and to the to the one S. Okay. Now, in addition, the electrons from the upper shell, like the two P three half and one half, they can also come down to fill the hole, right? So they also emit fluorescence X ray. So these are the characteristics so called K alpha one and K alpha two. So all the transitions are chemical sensitive, but in order to do that, we need high energy resolution to pick out the chemical sensitivity. So let's look at what happens if we, if we do the measurement. All right, so here's the measurement. So here's the K-alpha from uh, uh, to two different compounds, spread phosphor, which is a zero valent, and, and phosphate, of course, is five plus, right? And you can clearly see there's a chemical shift, right? So this is chemical shift, right? So by tracking the, the X-ray fluorescence or X-ray emission, and we can, we can determine uh, the, uh, uh, the chemical properties of different compounds. Now, and the bottom here is the K-beta, right? K-beta because it's a directly valence to core transition and you are mapping out the valence band. Now you're not only just mapping out the valence band, you are mapping out the valence band of phosphorus only. In fact, phosphorus peak character only because of the dipole transition. Okay, so all this is very nice, but in order to do that, we need to have very high resolution detection uh, uh, schemes, right? And most often in these energies, right? This is a tender X-ray energies. Uh, we use X-ray crystal analysis. So the energy has to has to be on the order of one electron mole, right? And and to be able to to get this data. Now, as I just mentioned, X-ray absorption can be measured by tracking the intensity of the fluorescence, right? Now the intensity of fluorescence actually is enhanced at resonance, right? And it also suppresses the core light broadening. So what I'm saying is if we can use a energy window detecting this fluorescence X-ray, say K1 alpha, with a very narrow energy window, then we will be able to to record the X-ray absorption spectrum with a very high energy resolution. And there are benefits for doing that as uh, it will become clear later on. All right, so now let's just put off the X-ray spectroscopy for a while. And let's look at the activities of platinum, right? Platinum is a good catalyst, everybody knows that, especially in fuel cells, right? And the limiting reaction, of course, is the oxygen reduction reaction. Right now, platinum is a good catalyst according to the conventional uh, volcano plot. Right, and the main reason is the interaction of the palladium d orbitals, both the occupy and occupy, uh, in the vicinity of the Fermi level, with that of the oxygen. Okay, so in order to modify or enhance uh, the selectivity or activity of platinum, and we have to engineer. All right, it would be nice if we can control the D band, right? We can control the D band. All right, so this is the work uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, by my recent student, uh, Jatang Chen, he just graduated. The idea is trying to make the platinum uncomfortable by either compressing it or stretching it or alloying it with other materials, right? So this end up, uh, ends up into sort of two different effects we can use to, uh, to make the, to, to modify the, the D states, right, uh, in the vicinity of the Fermi level, right? And of course, uh, and by doing that, depending, say, in the case of core shell, putting platinum on, 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 on the substrate with smaller size or larger size, right? And of course, you can also make alloy, okay? By doing this, we are tracking, we are trying to put the strain and the ligand effect into platinum to change, to modify uh, the distance uh, around the further metaphor. And, and hence, uh, by doing that, we can also, we can modify the activity uh, of platinum, okay?
So how do we do that? All right, we look at a we look at a series of a series of platinum uh, liquid alloys, right? By alloying them, uh, we are putting in both the strain effect and the ligand effect, right? So in general, uh, the strain effect, if you're putting in the lattice that is smaller, and then you're compressing the platinum and the DVM will, will, will widen. And, uh, and on the other hand, if you're diluting, diluting the platinum, uh, then uh, the D band will nano. So these two competing effects uh, will play it out itself, right? We want to see how this plays out. So we do two kinds of measurements. One is the X-ray absorption measurements at the at the platinum L3 edge. We're exciting the core electron. We are propping the five D states, right? And the other is we are actually looking at the valence to core transition. We are trying to map out the the 5D contribution of platinum uh, to the alloy D band. All right, so here is the data of a series of platinum nickel bimetallic alloys, right? Uh, and we do the X-ray absorption using a normal standard, uh, uh, the solid state detector, right? And and do it. And that's that's what everybody doing normally, okay? And you can see there's uh, at the absorption edge, is there's, a, there's a spike, which is called the white line. And the area under the curve here, right? In, in, in here uh, is related to the unoccupied platinum 5D states, right? Or 5D holes uh, in the D-band, okay? And similarly, we can analyze liquid as well. And then where we are getting, because it's the S to P, S to P transition, then we are getting the P character. But let's focus on the platinum, okay? All right, so by analyzing the area under the curve, which is directly proportional to the D host or the unoccupied five D states in platinum, right? And we can get this as this is a trend, okay? There's a trend to see how this changes upon alloying as we're starting diluting platinum in nickel. Now the bottom data is is the Fourier trans from the egg cells, which basically uh, gives us some idea about the. Uh, the structure, local structure of platinum in the alloy, as you can see from here, right? And the lattice actually contracts, obviously, because the liquid is smaller than platinum, right? In, in the alloy, okay? So the platinum is compressed, it's compressed, all right? That would increase the deep band. All right, okay, so now what is high energy resolution uh, fluorescent detection of XAS and XES then, right? Why can we do it with just a conventional uh, detector? The reason is the following. So let's just look at, look at this situation, right? Now, as I said, X-ray absorption spectrum can often be recorded as fluorescence yield, right? You, you detect the fluorescence, okay? And so in this experiment, we are looking at the palladium L3H and the V2 core transition of a series of lico uh, platinum alloys, right? These are the corresponding transitions. So the trick is we have to use high energy resolution detector or analyzer, a detectant system, okay? Let me just give you an example. All right, so if you use a normal solid state detector, which is energy resolution of a couple hundred electron volts, but if you use a crystal analyzer, the detector, and we can narrow this down to the order of one electron volt, or, okay? So this one electron volt, in fact, it's, it's a lot smaller than the coho lifetime broadening uh, of, the, of the absorption. And when this happens, we can circumvent the uncertainty principle, right? So we can make the pit a lot sharper. Okay, all right, and the tricks. So this kind of uh, uh, analyzer uh, is based on uh, on the crystal detectors, crystal analyzers, right? Typically with a spherical band or cylindrical band crystals uh, uh, analyzer, right? So the X-ray comes in here, the sample, and here's the analyzer, then we have an area sensitive detector. And by doing that, uh, let me show you the results. What happens when we do this? All right. 
Okay, here the data uh, shows on the left hand side is with with the conventional detector and uh, or the L3 edge and then let me see, and the, the green, the those in green, right? Those in green, so this is the area under the curve, is the normal X-ray absorption with a solid detector, right? But this blue area under the curve, it's the same compound, right? It's just detecting with different, uh, detector of different S solution. And you can see the pitch sharpens considerably. So therefore it's a lot easier to get accurate information from this data. Okay, so here just the detailed analysis. Indeed, by doing uh, high energy detection, all right, you can get much better, uh, more reliable. We can also suppress the, uh, the background and so on. All right, LICS, X-ray uh, emission spectroscopy also allows us to prop. Uh, we want to know the 5D contribution to the valence band in the alloy, right? There's no any other technique that can do that because uh, we don't know which density of states belong to platinum, which, which belongs to LACO, but use, use uh, uh, valence to call transition, we can pick up the platinum 5D. And here's the, uh, the general energetics. So we're exciting the system, all right, to intermediate state and then allow you to decay and emits a, it emits a photon, right? This photon uh, is, is in less energy than excitation energy, right? Okay, so uh, it, the interesting physics is that we, when this energy is approaching uh, the threshold, but not quite there, uh, this is uh, what we are seeing is resonant in elastic X-ray scattering. Uh, but when the energy is at or about the edge, we are seeing the resonant X-ray emission, right? This will be XES, okay? Uh, and this is what we do, right? This is what we do. Uh, we, we, uh, 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 exciting uh, cause they have with the elastic back pit, right? So that has no loss. The incident energy has no loss. It provides us the calibration also. So by putting all those to together, we can see a series of spectrum, right? Of course, say we're exciting uh, from below to above the edge, right? And then we are detecting the elastic pit, elastic pit as well as the valence bed, okay? So we can do this for all the samples uh, in here. Right, and then we put them together. We find the lateral sweep and put them there in this in this figure. So now the green pit are the elastic pit, the excitation energy, and the blue pit is the valence band, uh, the five D contribution to the valence band. You can see we really need high energy versus roton to be able to distinguish be between these pits. If you take a close look. And this is what we see, right? The Venus band actually broadens in the alloy, right? Uh, and uh, and it, 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 a high concentration, but it's, it's it starts to dilute further uh, than the Venus band becomes the laterals. So this is merely for the first time we are seeing this composition between say and ligand effect, right? And one would lead to a wider B D band, the other would lead to a lateral D band, right? So we can see this compact effect. And of course, the reason is the atomic radius of platinum is much greater than that of the uh, of the Lego. Okay, all right. So here's a summary. All right, so high resolution uh, can really do better, right? To give us a better, more accurate measurement. Uh, and we can naturally, uh, with better estimate, we can correlate the DO state with cat catalysis uh, performance, right? So we've done that in these two papers. I don't have time to go into that. And we also, for the first time, we can, we can figure out the 5D contribution to the valence span uh, of the planar nickel alloy. All right, so POSFX, right? Uh, Singletron can do all kinds of things. Here, I'll give you two examples. One's in situ operandal studies of energy materials. So let's look at lithium ion battery with the lithium ion phosphate as a cathode, right? Okay, so we can use a console, and this is a general situation. So on the left, on the, and this is work is by two of my former students. They're on the staff of the Canadian Night Source right now. So on the left-hand side, you 
see how the iron absorption changes as the system is undergo charging, right? So going from low energy to high energy, right? I mean, low energy meaning iron two and iron three. Okay, this is going from iron three to iron two, right? And there you can see the two uh, isobestic points here. So indicating that there's a lot of intermediate states as this is taking place, right? So the bottom map, you just, now we can not only track the iron, which is the key, we can also the iron uh, phosphate, right? And you can see during charging, uh, the phosphate peak actually changes. And you can see the changes is due to distortion because of this relationship, right? Whereas we see this in other resonance, which is based on the electrolyte. The electrolyte, of course, doesn't change, okay? But the phosphate in the lithium iron phosphorus changes as it should. Uh, slightly, but we can detect it. Now we can also do sodium oxygen uh, air, sodium air batteries, right? So here's a, a, a study where we track how the sodium oxide or sodium peroxide changes uh, in a sodium air battery. So we are tracking the oxygen environment, right? Uh, by doing oxygen K absorption. So this is the work of these two gentlemen. And, uh, and we can see uh, during the charging discharging process, we can track the appearance, the disappearance of a uh, high star resonance, which, uh, which are present only when you have unsaturated the oxygen oxygen bond or in dioxygen uh, uh, molecular species, okay? And here's the two extremes, all right? Fully charged, you don't see any uh, of this. And, and when it's, it's uh, a fully discharged, obviously you see uh, di molecular dioxygen molecular species. So you can do all this. In fact, in vacuum, we have well designed the uh, in solvex rays, okay? Now, and finally, I want to show you some of the recent uh, uh, setup at Canadian night source. Uh, the, it's the XES, right, X-ray emission, right? The trick is that we, uh, the unique feature now is we have an integrated uh, in, in a grout box, we can do chemical sensitive, air sensitive, uh, moisture sensitive stuff. And we use the crystal analyzer to provide very good energy resolution, okay? All right, here just some example of what we can do. So here is, uh, we, we test a breath. Uh, you can actually separate them, all right? So this is gonna be my last slide, my last slide, okay? Uh, so what you see is that uh, by exciting below the resonance, the electrolyte, you can only track the, the fluorescence uh, from the black uh, phosphorus, and then you can see. Right, it's due to this. And then, so this is the uh, beta is all the same, right? Although I have one more slide, but well, this is my last slide, right? X-ray, a uh, synchrotron X-ray can also do, do imaging. You can retrieve, tarnish, photograph, and in great detail if you do it right. So, um, and this is my last slide. And at this point, I want to thank all the people who've been involved and the funding agency and the synchrotrons and so on.